I think most of the people who, you know, um, are familiar with this area know that women often spend six, seven, eight, nine, ten years with symptoms before the diagnosis is made. For many women who present to their general practitioners or their healthcare professionals and say that they have pain, particularly in association with their periods, they're simply fobbed off as this being a normal part of everyday life for women. I think in society that there's this idea of I want to be able to say I have a high pain threshold and I can cope with things and it makes people feel like they're resilient to be able to say that and if they don't cope other people may make them feel guilty for not coping so well with it. The perception out there in the world is that you know period pain is normal and I think a degree of period pain is quite true for many women. Pain is something that you can't rate it, you can't compare my pain to your pain. Often women with endometriosis will come from households where their mum might have had endometriosis, their sisters might have endometriosis, aunts, grandmothers. And so within that family unit as well, things can um, be, be normalised in that way. I would always recommend that if women are having pain with their periods, between their periods, whether they have pain with intercourse or when they open their bowels or use their bladder, that they present to their doctors and they tell them that they may have some of the symptoms consistent with endometriosis. That way it's easier for us to assist them to make the diagnosis in the first place. In a topic that is so hard to measure, it's very easy to dismiss. Whereas if you had a broken arm and we could do an x-ray, we can see it. You have a break. I think a lot of women with endometriosis unfortunately have a delay in diagnosis and this might be because health professionals have, have discounted or normalised their symptoms at the start. Uh, it may also be that they've got a, a slightly irregular constellation of symptoms so they're not presenting with the classic period pain and therefore they're, they're missed in terms of what, what the different causes of their pain could be. Endometriosis is a really paradoxical disease um, because the symptoms don't always match the extent of the disease. Endometriosis is a very insidious disease and unfortunately it can be found in any area of the body and it's been reported in some very strange locations such as the thumb, the knee and even in the brain. So in my practice, I've seen women who can present with uh, problems associated with bleeding into their chest every time they get a period and they have collapse of a lung. They can have strange neurological symptoms where they fall over and they can present with painful joints. These are very unusual types of endometriosis, but it's just part of this whole insidious picture that is endometriosis. Uh, doctors can better themselves by uh, being made more aware and being educated about the disease, uh, and in particular, uh, by being willing to refer uh, patients on to specialists who um, specialise in treating endometriosis. The only way that we have uh, currently to make an absolute diagnosis is surgery. That means you've got to have an invasive procedure to get the tissue and make the diagnosis by looking at that underneath the microscope. We don't yet have any blood tests or scans that will definitely make the diagnosis of endometriosis, although there's a lot of research going on that here in Australia and around the world. It's important to understand that there are really two types of pelvic endometriosis. You have disease growing on the lining tissues around the pelvis or the, on the peritoneum, or disease growing within the ovary itself. Um, peritoneal endometriosis can only be diagnosed by laparoscopy, whereas ovarian endometriosis can quite accurately be diagnosed by ultrasound. Every woman that complains of some sort of symptoms relating to her gynaecological health will have a pelvic ultrasound done. And I don't think that um, as people doing pelvic ultrasounds, we've done those women justice in general 
because of the narrowness of the focus that's been typical. Most of those pelvic scans have become quite formalised into a specific routine of what you do, what you look at, what you report. And endometriosis is a little bit left field. You know, it's, it's not always going to be there in the structures and the things that you look for. If there's not a cyst of endometriosis in the ovary, it's very easy to just not see evidence of endometriosis. When you do an ultrasound, you're not just taking a series of still photographs. It's what we call a real-time technique. So you can see the result of what you're doing in terms of where you're moving your camera and what you're manipulating in the process happen on the screen in front of you. And it's that that sequence or that film that gives you <clears throat> almost like tactile feedback on what you're looking at. And that's where you often get the clues about endometriosis. Because if we go back to the idea that endometriosis is a, a process that causes scarring, then you lose that beautiful mobility that's part of a normal pelvis. So the bladder has to be able to expand, the bowel has to be able to expand and, and contract, and the uterus has to be able to grow around a pregnancy. The ovaries have to be able to release an egg and the fallopian tube has to be able to reach that ovary and collect the egg. So they're all processes that where mobility is inherent. And what you recognise in endometriosis is that as soon as it becomes um, reasonably severe, you lose that mobility. And on ultrasound, you can actually recognise that mobility if you look for it, because you can gently move things around and see them move in front of you on the, on the screen. And if you don't see that same mobility, that's a red flag. And women who have particularly bad endometriosis, they lose those natural spaces in the pelvis that you can look at. So they're spaces behind the things that we normally look at. So again, it's just a question of knowing where to look and how to go looking for it. And then the last thing is that the uterus that has bad endometriosis often gets crumpled, almost like those plastics that, you know, if you burn, they sort of pull and puck it together. Endometriosis does that. And so you'll see the distortion in the way the uterus is sitting, that sort of natural lie. And that's actually recognisable on ultrasound. So many pelvic scans are being done every day for these non-specific symptoms that with a little bit more education, the people doing those pelvic scans and maybe less so those reporting on the pelvic scans um, could actually start to recognise some of the so-called sort of red flags for what might be suggesting endometriosis. If you're trying to get the same detail by doing a scan that's essentially all done through the front of the tummy, it's got to be incredibly bad endometriosis to recognise it. The role of ultrasound with, with the teenager or the, the very young woman that presents with these symptoms, I think that's inherently very tricky. Um, and one of the reasons that it's difficult is if we, if we take the symptom of painful periods, that's an incredibly common symptom in young women. The other thing that compounds it is that ultrasound, well, the sort of ultrasound that we're talking about where you can look at the detail that, we've, that we talk about in terms of mobility and structure and so forth in the pelvis, that's done with a transvaginal ultrasound. So you, you have to insert the camera inside the vagina to get the views that we're talking about. And that's not always going to be possible in the teenager. That being said, I think it's realistic to say that quite a lot of teenagers that come to me for a scan are sexually active. And so they're quite prepared to undergo a transvaginal scan. So I think it's always worth asking the question and, and letting the woman decide what she's comfortable with. <laughs>